Welcome to the second day of ITM Hull. Um, I hope you had a nice afternoon and evening uh, yesterday, and we're really excited moving forward into the next day. Just a few announcements that I need to say before we have our keynote speech with, 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 with Jess Tom. So, first of all, I was very rude and didn't introduce our visual minutes. Um, this is Holly and Claire, who are in the corner doing more than minutes. Um, If you uh, went to the late night meeting point last night, you will have seen their fantastic work that was that they took from the keynote, Sade's keynote speech yesterday. We'll do that each day, and then we will compile all three and, ha and have them on display um, at the farewell brunch on Sunday. Just a few other things we need to run through. Um, so the artistic program, we're very pleased, has proved to be incredibly popular. Um, can I just reinforce what we said yesterday? Pl you will be unable to buy tickets from the venues apart from Hull Truck. So for the shows that are on today, which is Middle Child and Silent Uproar, you can get the tickets here. All of the tickets can be bought from the box office and online, but they cannot be purchased on the door at the venue. So please, if you want to at attend the shows, please do buy them um, in advance. A little bit of business. Uh, this afternoon at four o'clock, there's two sessions, one called Professional Mobility and one that's called Diversifying the Workforce. Originally, device, Diversifying the Workforce was in the rehearsal room and Professional Mobility was an Interact. We've now swapped those over. So diver Diversifying the Workforce will now be Interact, which is on the first floor, uh, and Professional Mobility will be in the rehearsal room, which is through the corridor and up onto the second floor. Um, the, the other thing as well is you will have seen, obviously, our blue-coated volunteers around, and I hope that they've been really helpful to you. I'm sure that they have. You will have met them on the registration desk and in all the venues walking around the city. Um, we're very proud of our volunteer program in Hull, um, and it's a really strong, thriving, inclusive scheme. Harriet Johnson is here, who is the volunteer program manager, and Harriet's very, very happy to talk to anyone who wants to talk to about the program and the infrastructure for it and the way it works as a really great example of um, incl inclusivity um, in the city. So that is uh, pretty much everything that I want to say. Um, we've got a couple of uh, special guests here to do some opening remarks bef before, before Jess comes on and does her keynote speech. So. So first of all, uh, can I introduce Darren Henley, who's the Chief Executive for Marks Council England. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to Hull, the sunshine capital of Europe. Um, <laughs> I lived here in Hull for three years, and let me tell you, every single day, it's as sunny and as warm <laughs> as this. Anything you've heard about the North Sea and what it does to our weather, completely rubbish. Um, you're very, very welcome, especially all of the uh, delegates from uh, across Europe and around the world. One of the things, especially today, we want to say from the artistic community here in this country is that we are very much open for business and you are very, very welcome in our country. So. <laughs> and we know how creativity uh, thrives across the world because different artists from different backgrounds come together and tell their stories. So I think the most exciting thing today is that opportunity uh, for you, artists including Peter Andre, uh, go uh, around the world, who, who, uh, who, who get the opportunity to, uh, to actually talk to each other, to discover uh, different people from different backgrounds, and uh, I think that's one of the most exciting things uh, today. Obviously here in this great city, uh, this was City of Culture in 2017, and uh, it's a city that's on a journey of change, and it, it's a city which absolutely has creativity uh, at its heart, and we're very excited about that. There's three sort of, uh, well, four eyes that I want to leave you with in, in, in my introduction. First is, is the importance of internationalism and, and, and being international, and that is really, really important. But then inspiration. This is a city that is inspirational. Uh, it's a city that's been known for innovation, and it's a city where the artists who are based here um, have I imagination. And uh, the conference themes today around diversity and inclusion uh, are something that's absolutely central to what we believe in and what we do uh, at Arts Council England. There's a, there's a lot of my colleagues from Arts Council England who are here who are going to just wave to you now. You know, that's an audience virtually made up of my colleagues. You know. um, but uh, you know, please, do, please do talk to us. We are really interested to build greater links with colleagues 
from all over the world and especially across Europe. So please do come and talk to us. We are open for business, as I say, we're open for ideas. And when I talk about those words about creativity and innovation, obviously colleagues at British Council uh, are, are really, really important as well. So I'm now going to hand over to, to Andrew Jones. But before I do that, I just to say, Jess is absolutely fantastic. She's someone who we have invested in at Arts Council England over the years. She's a brilliant speaker, so you'll enjoy hearing from her. But now, Andrew Jones from British Council. <laughs> Morning, everybody. Lovely to see you, see you here on the uh, momentous day that never was. <laughs> and maybe, maybe never will be. We'll see. Anyway. Um, after the fantastic stand-up warm-up uh, act we've got from Darren, mine's going to be the warm-down. So uh, I'm going I'm to stick to my notes as much as I can to get through this quickly. Um, I, I do need to say some, some thanks to people. So all of the, the partners in this project, um, Arts Council England, particularly Pete Massey, uh, Jessica Farmer and Hannah Bentley from the Leeds office, um, to Hull City Council, Visit Britain, the IAM, uh, IETM Secretariat and... and um, and you know everybody involved on the ITM side in making this happen. They are core stakeholders, and of course the absolutely cultured team. Um, without we couldn't have done this, and they've worked incredibly hard to pull this project together at really, really short notice. And special thanks must go to that for that to uh, somebody sitting over there, to Chris Wright, and to his, his colleague Sammy Hindmarsh, who, who've led in the production of the event and have been absolutely fantastic to work with. Um, I'd also like to thank Leeds City Council, who were the sponsors of the pre-meeting for those people who went to it on Wednesday, and also to Walk in Talking Project and Leeds Dance Partnership for organising that. Um, the idea of uh, having a plenary meeting in Hull was initially proposed back in 2015 at an IETM meeting um, as a potential legacy project to the partnership that the British Council had with the organizers of the Hull City of Culture program for 2017. Um, and the idea was that we would try to develop a number of international collaborations with local artists. Um, the willingness and determination of one of those, art those artists in particular, a guy called Andy Pearson, who some of you may know, from the Heads Up Festival and from Ensemble 52, without him, and then subsequently without the support of Alison Andrews and Richard uh, um, Sobey from the Walking Talking Project, we couldn't have really started the conversation, so again, without them, we wouldn't be here today. Um, our discussions started back in 2015, as I said, so that was some time before, of course, the ill-fated referendum that we had the following year. At that time, we saw this event as being one which was going to be a celebration of the power of art to maybe transform people's lives in different ways and to show the determination of artists to do that. Um, Obviously, the outcome of the referendum put a slightly different slant on things. And the, and the, 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 the prog... The <laughs> exactly, yes, him. That one, the bad one. Um, and, um, and, it, and, it, and, and obviously, it sort of, to a degree, informed when we were going to try to hold that meeting. So that is why we are here right now. And obviously, like everything else, nothing's really happening at the moment. Um, but the, it was a compelling argument to bring the, bring, to bring the event to hell. Uh, on this weekend, uh, particularly in a place where, you know, 70% of the population nearly voted to leave. Um, there's a very, very st stereotypical kind of notion of the people that are voting to leave, that, you know, they may be ill-informed, um, they may be plain stupid, and that's certainly not the case. And what was really apparent in the actual year of culture was how the general population of the city actually really embraced and loved the cultural offer that they got, which included a lot of international... Uh, uh, events. Um, so yes, it was a compelling argument until a couple of weeks ago, and of course we got a, an extra dose of political chaos land, you know, landing on us, and now we never know when we are going to leave. So um, I was going to suggest that maybe we could all pack our bags and maybe come back on April the 12th, <laughs> or maybe come back on May the 22nd, <laughs> or maybe come back next year. Who knows? And I thought maybe later on today we could actually build into the programme an indicative vote. I'd be very, very <laughs> happy about that. Um, but to be serious, the, the, the fact that, you know, the, the, I think the, uh, the, the UK delegates amongst us will, will, will share uh, my, my feelings that the, so many international delegates have actually sort of come to this event. There's somewhere between 250 and 300 international people here. 
that the fact that they've all come when, when you know, circumstances are so uncertain is quite extraordinary. So the s most special thanks must go out to the international people that are, that are in the room and have come to this meeting. I, I think it's truly, truly moving that you've come here at this moment. I think it shows the strength and, and, and solidarity, not only of this network, but of you in solidarity with, with the UK performing arts sector. So really, really thank you so much. Um, I'm nearly done, honestly. Um, I hope the discussions you all have over the next few days will be fruitful. Um, on a personal level, the art that resonates for me the most strongly is art that explores and describes the human condition in some meaningful way. Um, and with that in mind, looking at art through the lens of inclusion right now, I think is, is really, really vitally important when there's so much division around us. Um, one of the underlying reasons that people voted, or so many people voted to leave during the referendum was a lack of understanding from the political class and the privilege in our societies of the real human conditions that people face every day. The conditions outside this building can be summed up in a quote that I found in The Guardian recently from a Yorkshire head teacher, so I'm going to read you that quote. Um, we have... W yes, we are, Jess, we are fucked. We have too many children with no heating in the home no food in the cupboards, washing themselves with cold water, walking to school with holes in their shoes and trousers that are ill-fitted and completely worn out, and living on one hot meat um, I'm, I'm going to cry, sorry. living on one hot meal a day provided at school. So on that rather stern note, I will end and just say that for me that's a reminder of the context of this meeting. So I hope you have really, really powerful and meaningful discussions. And now I'll hand over to the uh, fantastic Jess Tom from Tourette's Hero. Thanks. Biscuit. For clarity, we're not in Legoland. Sausage for... Pizza bread. Biscuit. I'm also going to try and operate my own slides, so <laughs> just a heads up. <laughs> we might not do them in order, and the front row get ready to catch. <laughs> Fuck. Um, biscuit. Um, hello. It's so lovely to see you all. Fuck it. Biscuit. My name's Jess. Biscuit. And my sign name is Jess. Fuck a goat. Biscuit. Fuck it. I love cats. Introduction. Flying start. Sausage. <laughs> um, biscuit. I'm an artist, an activist, um, and a part-time superhero. Fuck it. Um, I, I love pita bread. <laughs> I mean, I don't have any strong feelings on pita bread. <laughs> I fucking love pita bread. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to just do an hour on pita bread. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> biscuit, sausage, biscuit. Fuck. You're laughing, but it's quite possible at this point. <laughs> Sausage. Biscuit. Um, I have Tourette's syndrome. Biscuit. A neurological condition that means I make movements and noises I can't control called ticks. Biscuit. Pita bread. We're not doing this Tourette's. <laughs> Sausage. Um, I'm going to describe myself very briefly for anyone who might find this useful. I'm a piece of pita bread. <laughs> <laughs> who would have thought it would be bread that would undermine me this morning? <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> um, biscuit. I'm going to try and describe myself. Biscuit, I'm a 30-something white woman. Biscuit of average build. Biscuit for pita bread. <laughs> of average build. Biscuit with curly brown hair and a very cool wheelchair. Ta -da! Biscuit, fuck. Um, to my right is Katie, our BSL interpreter and our stripper. <laughs> Hedgehog. Biscuit, sausage. Biscuit, um, Hedgehog Biscuit, it's her job to sign everything I say, Biscuit, including all the biscuits, hedgehogs, and cats, and cantilever bridges. <laughs> yeah, that'll do. <laughs> so 
that's it. Um, Biscuit, all the slides I'll be showing, Biscuit, are colourful, hand-drawn cards, uh, sharing a key idea or giving the title of each section. I'll read each of these out in turn. Biscuit, I will also show a few images which I'll describe Biscuit in more detail when I get to them. They're all of Stan Collimore, Biscuit, waving a sheep. I mean, they're not, that's very niche. <laughs> Sausage. Um, biscuit, this is a relaxed talk, so if you want to tick, shout, or move about, you're more than welcome. And um, please don't go out if you need to and come back in at any time. Sausage. Biscuit, um, having Tourette's means I'm neurologically incapable of staying on message, as I've already demonstrated. <laughs> Fuck it, biscuit. Um, biscuit, on the plus side, though, it does mean biscuit, I only ever have to write half a talk. Uh, <laughs> Fuck it, biscuit. Biscuit. Um, and awkward silences aren't something I worry about either. <laughs> Sausage! Um, Biscuit, there are three things you need to know straight away. I love cats, that's not one of them. <laughs> Fuck. Um, Biscuit, firstly, you're going to hear the words biscuit and hedgehog um, a lot in the next hour. Biscuit, hedgehog, Toblerone. <laughs> and possibly Toblerone. Um, fuck, Biscuit, secondly, and I think you've got this already, if I say something funny, you're absolutely allowed to laugh. Fuck it! In fact, it would be a bit odd if you didn't fuck a goat. <laughs> if you didn't laugh, not if you didn't fuck a goat. <laughs> We're relaxed, but maybe not that relaxed. <laughs> biscuit, sausage, biscuit. Um, finally, several times a day, my tics intensify and I completely lose control of my body and speech. Biscuit, this looks seizure-like and needs similar management. Um, if that happens, put Grandmaster Flash on. <laughs> Biscuit, if that happens, my support worker will help me. Um, biscuit, sausage, and Chris will take over with, 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 a, with a dance about lemon curd. <laughs> Got that sorted, great. <laughs> so that's genuine jeopardy. Um, biscuit, um, biscuit, biscuits without borders, a call to action. I believe, biscuit, we all share the power and responsibility for inclusivity. Legislation, Biscuit, resources and knowledge have important roles to play, Biscuit, but to build sustainable, inclusive communities, we need to think, talk and take action together. Biscuit, as professionals, Biscuit, working within the arts sector, you are perfectly placed to make a significant contribution to catalyzing much needed change. Beans, fuck it. Biscuit, fear creates barriers. Biscuit, as you can probably tell, having Tourette's, Biscuit, means I'm rarely still or quiet. Biscuit, I fuck a goat. Biscuit, um, ticks turn ordinary tasks, like fucking a goat. <laughs> Not an ordinary task, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> it's very complicated. Biscuit, um, when Darren says the Arts Council have invested in me. <laughs> Not goat sex. They haven't invested in goat sex. <laughs> Fuck it. Um, biscuit, biscuit. Um, ticks can turn ordinary tasks like making a cup of tea, um, biscuit, or chopping vegetables, biscuit, into extreme sports. Fuck a goat, biscuit. Um, they go everywhere I do, and they're often the first thing that people notice about me. Sausage, biscuit, fuck. When in my early 20s, they began to ha intensify and have a bigger impact on my life. I began, biscuit, I started to notice the fear that crept in with them. Fear of me, biscuit. Was I drunk or dangerous, biscuit? And my own fear of other people's unpredictable reactions to me. Fuck it. Some people were scared to catch my eye, biscuit. Others seemed worried about saying the wrong thing. Fuck, biscuit. A few thought I was possessed. Possessed. Out, vile spirits. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it, biscuit. It scared me, biscuit. I was frightened of losing control of my body and my identity. But it was other people's assum assumptions, biscuit, judgments, and laughter that worried me most. Biscuit, I could feel this fear 
forming barriers in my life. And fear wasn't the only problem. The many unspoken rules of our society. Don't shout about Peter Andre on, on a train. I mean, it is an unspoken rule. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Biscuit. The unspoken rules, particularly in our cultural spaces, formed a whole wall of barriers. Biscuit. That at times felt impenetrable. Biscuit. I started avoiding places Biscuit, I perceived as quiet. Biscuit. A donkey's rectum. <laughs> For, biscuit. Never given it any thought before. <laughs> biscuit, donkey rectum, biscuit. And my life became inclu increasingly restricted as a result. For, then I had a conversation with my friend Matthew, biscuit, that radically changed the way I viewed my condition. Biscuit. Finding my power. Matthew described Tourette's as a crazy language generating machine. Biscuit. And told me not doing something creative with it would be wasteful. Biscuit. This idea took root and was how I came to understand that my tics were my power and not my problem. Biscuit. My life was changed by a single sentence. And it taught me, Biscuit, that every conversation, Biscuit, has the potential to create change. For, together, Biscuit, Biscuit, Matthew and I founded Tourette's Hero, Biscuit, to celebrate the creativity and humour of Tourette's and to campaign for a more inclusive society. Biscuit, Tourette's Hero has been instrumental in helping me deal with my own assumptions and to start addressing other people's. Biscuit. Tackling fear head on, Biscuit, is crucial when promoting inclusivity. Biscuit, because it's all too easy to let it lead to inaction. Biscuit, in my experience, isolation is rarely something that happens suddenly. It's a gradual process of feeling increasingly shut out. Biscuit, Tourette's Hero's mission is to change the world one sheepdog at a time, it's not quite that. <laughs> Biscuit, one tick at a time. This simple yet radical aim informs our practical, political, and artistic approach, Biscuit, to making work and engaging audiences. For my ticks are my power, Biscuit, because they let me do things neurotypical people can't do, like collide words together to create incredible new concepts, donkey porn, Probably not a new concept. <laughs> Donkey porn? Oh, yeah. I understand the laugh now. <laughs> Biscuit, um, without my unusual neurology, Biscuit, we wouldn't have the joy of disco penguins dancing in your dreams. Biscuit, the history of iguanas can be written in a teapot. Fuck. Or Donald Trump, darker than an eclipse in an earthworm's mind. Fuck it. Biscuit. Biscuit. Biscuit's not Brexit. <laughs> Fuck. Sausage. Biscuit. Fuck. Through Tourette's Hero, I reframe the symptoms of my condition as a creative springboard. Biscuit. And invite people to make artwork in response. Some of my favourites include Biscuit. Um, biscuit, stuff my mouth with pencils. Biscuit, a line drawing on graph paper showing a man with 66 red pencils in his mouth. Biscuit, I counted them all. Biscuit, fuck. Um, Kanye West killed Rupert the Bear yesterday. Biscuit, <laughs> Kanye is moving hurriedly out of the picture. The body of a bloody bear lies behind him. Biscuit, um, I've got limbs. They're multiplying. <laughs> biscuit, fuck. The two lead characters from the film um, Grease, Sandy is on the left and Danny is on the right. Um, Biscuit, they're both wearing tight black dancewear and both have arms growing out of their arms which look like branches of a tree. Biscuit, hedgehog. Before Tourette's Hero, I found it hard to talk about Tourette's without tears. Recognizing the creative potential of my tics and developing the language and confidence to talk about them. Biscuit. 
has had a more powerful impact than I could ever have imagined. Changing the way we think has radical potential to unlock new ways of being. And I'm about to tell you about an idea biscuit, that radically transformed how I thought about myself. The social model. Fuck it! Um, <laughs> has anyone heard of the social model of disability before? Woo! Great. Um, I'm also really excited uh, for anyone who hasn't heard of it before, because I get to tell you about something brilliant. Ta-da! Um, for a long time, thinking about disability followed either a medical or charity model. These both see people as being disabled because their bodies or minds are impaired in some way. As a result, they focus on the need for cure or pity. Both focus on what is wrong with a person and not on what a person actually needs. By contrast, Biscuit, the social model, says disability isn't caused by people's bodies or minds, but by how society is structured. For example, if I can't get into a building because it's surrounded by steps, the medical model would say, um, Biscuit, the problem was my wobbly legs. The charity model would ask you for money to help me walk again. Uh, Biscuit, please help me walk again. <laughs> Don't need that. <laughs> um, Biscuit. But by contrast, the social model identifies the steps as the disabling barrier. It understands that it's normal for bodies and minds to work differently. And for some people to have impairments and others not. Biscuit, the exciting thing about the social model is that by considering difference from the outset, we can create less disabling spaces, systems, and attitudes. Gordon Brown loves cats. I have no idea <laughs> if that's true or not. Fuck. I've heard many disabled people talk about the moment, uh, Biscuit, they learnt about the social model as an epiphany. Suddenly realising that they are not the problem. I passionately believe in the social model and it's the reason I call myself a disabled person rather than a person with a disability. Disability isn't something I drag around with me. And it's not a binary state. People are more or less disabled in different contexts according to their environment and circumstances. Biscuit, telling me you don't see me as disabled is not a compliment. Biscuit, it means you're telling me you don't see the barriers I face because of our collective failure to consider difference. Biscuit, only if barriers are acknowledged, Biscuit, can they be removed? Fuck a goat. For me, saying I'm, a, I'm disabled makes me feel strong. And it means I can help find solutions, belong to a vibrant community of people with a shared lived experience, and act in solidarity with them. This is particularly important at the moment because so many hard-won equalities and rights are being eroded by self-serving politicians, both in the UK and internationally. Fuck a goat. I love pizza. <laughs> Fuck. The medical and charity models are deeply embedded in our society, in what we see on TV, on our stages, and what we read in the papers. That's why I want as many people as possible to understand disability from the social model perspective. Connecting with this way of thinking has raised my confidence and it's been instrumental in defining how I've come to think of my body, my experiences and my expectations. Fuck a goat. With this in mind, the social model underpins much of what I'll be talking about for the remainder of this presentation. Fuck a goat. Peter Andre. I wish we were talking about Peter. Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. Um, my journey to the stage. As a teenager, I used to love going to theatres and galleries. But the more my movements and noises made me stand out, the harder I found it to go. And I'm not alone. Biscuit. Back in 2014, Biscuit, when I started work on my first stage show, Backstage in Biscuitland, I googled Tourette's 
theatre. This kid, and nearly all of the top results were accounts, of, were accounts of people with tics being asked to leave or sit separately. Fuck it, biscuit. Now though, biscuit is information about relaxed performance that's top of the search results. Ta-da! Biscuit. I created Backstage in Biscuitland after a particularly distressing experience at a London theatre. I was asked to move um, and sit in the sound booth at the interval because of the movements and noises I was making. Biscuit. As I sat sobbing in the sound booth, Biscuit, I promised myself that I would never set foot in another theatre again. Clearly, this is a promise I didn't keep. <laughs> Sausage. But um, instead, I decided to occupy the only seat in the house um, I wouldn't be asked to leave on stage. <laughs> Biscuit. But as well as telling my story, um, Biscuitland promotes relaxed performance. This is a growing movement that takes a flexible approach to noise and movements coming from the audience and extends a warm invitation to all. The brilliant thing about a relaxed performance is that everyone can benefit. This might include people with learning disabilities, dementia, movement disorders, biscuit people on the autistic spectrum, those with young children, biscuit babies, or just very loud laughs. Biscuit, fuck it. Biscuit. <laughs> Sausage. When they're done right, biscuit, they give the whole audience permission to relax move about and make noise. This fosters a more accepting and exciting theatrical environment for everybody. There is so much amazing work out there and I don't want anyone to miss out because of preconceptions about who it's for or how it should be enjoyed. Biscuit, fuck, biscuit. But disabled people shouldn't have to take to the stage to feel safe in our theatres, fuck. Biscuit. And this is where our most recent work at Battersea Arts Centre comes in. Fuck it. I love pits of bread. Um, a warmer welcome inside the relaxed venue. Biscuit. I work, I've been working with Battersea Arts Centre on an Arts Council England Changemaker project. Our biscuit. Together, we've been exploring what a relaxed venue might be like. At its simplest, Biscuit. This will flip assumptions about theatre etiquette. Rather than demanding reverent silence at every show with the occasional relaxed performance, a relaxed venue embeds a relaxed approach across all of its spaces and programmes. Let's get. Over the last two years, we've gone through the process of reviewing, creating, testing, and embedding inclusive practice at BOC. I love pizza bread. We've been working across teams to identify barriers and develop creative solutions to them. Three guiding principles for, uh, have emerged for what a relaxed venue will be, and I'd like to share these with you now. Fuck. First up, to create no new barriers. Using the social model, a relaxed venue understands that people with impairments are disabled by environments, systems, and attitudes. Relaxed venues commit to considering access at every stage of a project, Biscuit, to avoid creating any new barriers wherever possible. Biscuit. This principle is powerful and pragmatic. It understands that while you might inherit barriers that need time and resources to unpick. You can make a radical impact straight away by considering different types of body and mind whenever you set something up. This in turn means there are less barriers for future generations to grapple with. Ta -da! The second principle, to ensure equality of experience. Relaxed venues go beyond just ensuring they are technically accessible to disabled people. They work to ensure equality of experience while still providing opportunities to take creative risks. We need parity for disabled audience members and artists. 
whether that's being able to impulse buy tickets online in the middle of the night, access creative content in multi-sensory ways, or just go to the toilet backstage. Fuck! Biscuit. Biscuit. Finally, to reduce faff. <laughs> Relaxed venues acknowledge the damage systemic barriers can have on individual and community well-being. They aim to reduce faff biscuit around access requirements by ensuring they are understood, embedded, and confidently provided for. Our environments send us messages all the time. For disabled people, these messages are often, you haven't been thought about, this isn't for you, or you're a fire risk. Biscuit, fuck a goat. Fuck it, I love cats. Faff, so faff is like fuss, or um, a faff is like doing lots of stuff around something. So rather than just getting to the point and doing it, faff is all of the fuss around it. Faffing, sausage. <laughs> faff is what we've been doing with Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. Fuck. Biscuit. <laughs> um, biscuit. When it comes to messages in our environments, Biscuit, I notice all of the negative messages, but I also notice every act of inclusivity. The chill out room in case I need it, the floor plan arranged so I can wheel easily between tables, the receptionist who speaks directly to me rather than the person pushing my chair. We need to change the messages that, are biscuit, that our cultural spaces are sending. So everyone is being told, you're welcome, thought about, and valued. Fuck, sausage, including goats. <laughs> I'll allow you to work that out on an individual venue by venue basis. <laughs> what is your goat policy? <laughs> Fuck, biscuit, biscuit. These three principles are simple yet they have the potential to radically change the experience of disabled people in our shared cultural spaces as audience, artists, workers, and leaders. Sausage, biscuit. A call to action, again, biscuit. I'd like to talk now about three key challenges facing our sector, biscuit, and call on you all to respond with energy, creativity, and commitment. Fuck it. First, the politic biscuit. Try again, biscuit. The politics of now. Why art and activism matters. Biscuit. We're living at a time of intense change, under governments that have are systematically removing our safety nets. Many people at the hard end of this process go unrecognised. We must urgently acknowledge the political climate we're living in, the impact it's having on those around us, and the ever-increasing inequalities within our society. Biscuit. And it can't be passive or token tokenistic acknowledgement either. Biscuit. We have to embed equalizing measure measures in how we talk, plan, create, and resist. Biscuit. Biscuit. One of the most pernicious aspects of austerity in the UK has been the quiet adjustment, adjustment of eligibility criteria. Biscuit. From the outside, equalizing schemes appear unchanged. Biscuit. But by subtly moving the goalposts of who's eligible for them, many disabled people have lost vital support and too many have lost their lives. Biscuit. So, as someone who's worked with disabled children in London for over 20 years, I've seen firsthand the terrible impact of these adjustments. Biscuit. Children who a few years ago would have had comprehensive support now have nothing. And their opportunities to learn, play and grow are severely damaged as a result. Biscuit. Where will 
will the next generation of disabled artists come from if young people don't have the services they need to leave their homes, let alone set foot in a gallery or theater? This kid. We have to ensure young people know their rights, have opportunities to build skills, make friends, and voice dissent. We must listen to young people and ask them how we can be good allies, Biscuit, for the struggle ahead. Biscuit, in the nine years, Biscuit, since we founded Tourette's Hero, the idea that positive memories are protective, Biscuit, has underpinned much of the work we do, particularly with children and young people. We focus on events that build confidence um, and informal support networks. So disabled people have positive experiences to draw on when times are tough. Biscuit. Hedgehog, I love cats. Um, Biscuit, here's a photo from one of our events, this one at um, the Barbican. Biscuit, a child with outstretched arms looks up at colorful confetti balls around him. He's surrounded by lots of people of different ages and backgrounds. Confetti is flying everywhere. Ta-da! Biscuit. We initiate structural change through creative events with our partners. We work with venues to strip back and examine their rules and challenge normative privilege and insist on access for people with different types of body and mind. Fuck it! I love goats. Biscuit. But there is still a staggeringly long way to go before disabled people have equal access to our shared cultural life. And if disability isn't part of your lived experience, Biscuit, this inequality can easily remain invisible. Sausage. Um, Biscuit. This point was perfectly illustrated, Biscuit, by the public's response to a recent news story. Biscuit. A deaf mother was suing the promoter of the band Little Mix for not providing sign language interpretation for the whole of the concert after she'd asked for it. Biscuit. What seemed to surprise and enrage many people wasn't that this family had been discriminated against, but that a deaf woman Biscuit, would want access to a live music event at all. Biscuit. On BBC Two's Victoria Derbyshire programme, um, Biscuit, a viewer complained, but surely you might as well have a blind man sue Tate Modern because no one described the art to him. I mean, yes. <laughs> it's the Equality Act. <laughs> Fuck. Biscuit. Um, Biscuit. This response and many others um, like it are indicative of a society where there's, a, there's an extremely limited view of who art, music, and theatre are for, how they should be enjoyed, Biscuit, and whether goats are permitted. <laughs> there's more consensus around that, I think. <laughs> for, for, Biscuit, ensuring that difference is visible in our cultural spaces um, Biscuit, is crucial to challenging these damaging ideas Biscuit, and dissolving Biscuit, these invisible barriers. Sausage, I urge you to think about where you live or work. What hidden messages are being sent to marginalised people? There might not be a sign on the door saying no wheelchair users. But that's the practical reality of every building without um, a lift or a ramp. Biscuit, I am tired of going to exhibitions and having to roll past exhibit after exhibit because they're not at an accessible height. Or having to go through a separate, air, a separate entrance, usually via the bins. Biscuit. Or finding the accessible to toilet is being used as a bike shed. Biscuit. Over the last few years, I've been fortunate um, to travel internationally and meet disabled people from all over the world. Biscuit. And it's been fascinating, Biscuit, to see how conversations around access and rights are shaped by local context. 
I've also seen how hard it can be for artists in other countries, um, this get disabled artists in particular, to connect with each other, with venues and with audiences. This, get, this might be because of geographical, economic, or attitudinal barriers. Let's get, let's get. As an international community, let's get, of creative thinkers, we have to find ways to address these challenges. Dismantle the barriers and connect people across borders. Beans, fuck it. Biscuit, adjustable environments. Sausage dogs, biscuit. Knowing I can adjust my surroundings uh, to meet my changing requirements is both essential and transformative. I advocate strongly for making adjustments and for speaking up if something isn't working for you. But a few years ago, Biscuit, while I was being subjected to a barrage um, of disability hate fueled verbal abuse on a London bus, Biscuit, I became acutely aware of how important it is that we make the right adjustments. Biscuit, caught up in the abuse being hurled at me on that bus, I didn't get off, ask the driver to stop or use my phone to record the abuse. Instead, I adjusted to the situation biscuit, and let it go biscuit, unchallenged. At a time when many individuals and organizations are under intense, sustained pressure, biscuit, it's all too easy to adjust to what is happening, biscuit, rather, that make the necessary adjustments to systems and structures to meet our individual and collective requirements. Biscuit, fuck it. Biscuit, as a society, we must ensure we never adjust to inequality. Biscuit, biscuit. This is an essential act of resistance when governments are making thousands of adjustments to cut people out of our society. We must recognize our power to make the changes necessary to ensure that everyone is written in. Biscuit. Equalizing um, uh, measures may be simple, biscuit, in themselves, biscuit, but having the insight and capacity to implement them can be much more complex. Sausage. We need to talk, listen, collaborate, innovate, and improve. Biscuit. It's not the sole responsibility of people facing systemic oppression to demand change. It's a responsibility we all share. Biscuit. To create truly inclusive communities and societies, we have to be ready to remove the barriers. And that might mean adjusting the physical environment, the sensory landscape, the way we communicate, or the rules. Fuck it. Biscuit, my question for our cultural institutions isn't simply what adjustments can we make sure, can, can you make to ensure, um, Biscuit, you're accessible, but what adjustments can you make to ensure everyone feels safe to be themselves? Fuck. Biscuit, finally, Biscuit, the importance of rest. How to make art in healthy ways. Biscuit. Earlier this month, um, Tourette's Hero and Battersea Art Center collaborated on the two-week festival of rest and resistance, an intergenerational celebration of disability culture. Biscuit. Um, Biscuit. This is the pink and blue logo from the festival. Biscuit. At its center is a delic delicately drawn bed and a raised fist to represent the two key themes. Biscuit. It's important to acknowledge the link between disability arts and activism, as well as the need for opportunities for rest, solidarity, and self-care. Over 500 visitors participated in 20 events, um, performances and residencies. Over 40 disabled and non-disabled artists contributed and a refreshingly diverse range of perspectives were shared. It was encountering 
incredible disabled artists making exciting, challenging, funny work that rescued me from my own fears and preconceptions when I was younger. Biscuit, importantly, Biscuit, I saw my experience as a disabled person reflected in ways that avoided tired, complacent narratives often presented in mainstream media. Biscuit, we must keep looking for ways to strengthen our communities, connect talent to opportunity, and make a society that is responsive, representative, and relevant for everyone. Sausage. But we can't build Biscuit, our art on unhealthy and unequal practices. As a sector, we often expect people to work long hours, respond to emails 24 hours a day, um, or work for free. Biscuit, this unfairly disadvantages people for whom energy, money, or time are limited resources. It's not just the artist, you, artists you have in your buildings that matter. Biscuit. It's essential that we call out unhealthy work practices and nurture and care for everyone involved in this sector. Visibility matters because art, culture and humour are great at shifting thinking biscuit, and creating deeper understanding of difference. But only if people with lived experience take the lead. Biscuit, sausage. Um, change isn't always a battle. Biscuit. I used to think that attitude change was a long, drawn-out process. Tourette's Heroes taught me it can actually happen very quickly. Biscuit. Um, I first realised this on a train journey with my sister when we were on our way to a Hindu. Biscuit. The train was busy. I was very conscious that other passengers might be reacting to my tics. Biscuit. A brief search of social media Biscuit revealed that at least one woman had uh, noticed me. Biscuit. Biscuit. Hedgehog Biscuit. On a train with genuine Tourette's person in the same carriage. Biscuit. Here's the edited highlights. Biscuit. Biscuit. <laughs> I'm a baby. Donkey. What an affliction. Biscuit. I responded by saying it was also a gift and pointed her in the direction of our website and a video made by two performance artists which brought some of my tics to life. Biscuit. Her next tweet had a very different tone. Biscuit. This is amazing, not affliction, creativity. Biscuit. She then asked if she could use the video, Biscuit, in an installation about identity that she was going to later that day. Biscuit. I loved seeing this evolution happen in just a few short tweets. Biscuit. And it left me feeling incredibly optimistic. Biscuit. Creating change doesn't have to be a battle. It can be joyful, discursive, persuasive, and silly. Biscuit. If we can get people to engage, we can get them to change. Conclusion, I love cats. I mean, if this, if, if this talk has one message, it's, it's <laughs> cats are great, pita breads, biscuits should be ruling the art sector. <laughs> Fuck. Um, the confidence Skills and knowledge I've gained by being part of a creative community Biscuit, have helped me accept my body and my circumstances as they have changed. Sometimes people talk about access like it's a task you complete. It's a level on a video game. It's not. <laughs> it's not a task you complete. It's more useful to think about it as a process. Working to remove barriers is something we need to engage in every single day. Otherwise, just like other forms of systemic oppression, they have a nasty habit of returning. Biscuit. In a time of increasing division, it's more important than ever that we think and act openly and inclusively every day. We must make sure that we're sharing the biscuits, not fighting over the crumbs. Beans! Biscuit. 
changing our cultural landscape isn't too mighty a task. And it's definitely not something we should just leave to big institutions, politicians, or people wearing capes. This, it's something we can all do. Um, my challenge to you um, for today and beyond is to resist the urge to just speak to the same old people. Instead, be open to new experiences and ideas. Biscuit, these are crucial for forming and reflecting on your own views. Biscuit, discussion and collaboration can help unlock new ways of reducing barriers and expanding opportunity. Biscuit, as we head into the rest of today's sessions, please talk to new people, find out who they are, check in with how they're doing, and if you're up for it, Tell them about the borders you would like to shift within yourself and your community. Be generous and kind to each other as we undertake this challenge. And do come over and talk to me. Biscuit. I'll be the one shouting biscuit. Biscuit! Um, first, though, I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. So before we take any questions, I'm, I'm going to do my lemon curd dance. All right, yeah, excellent, uh, good. <laughs> um, so just to say, so we'll have... A, no, we'll, really, we'll, come on. Okay. <laughs> Music, please. So um, we'll take a few questions because uh, just be aware that the sessions, we're running a little bit late, but it's, I'm sure it's well worth it. Because um, sessions start at 11.30, so we'll take a few questions. So any questions from the floor? We'll have got a roaming mic that's going around. About cats. About cats specifically, please. Please don't ask me questions <laughs> about cats. Sausage! Hello, I love cats. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi, Jess. Hi. Caroline. Um, from Australia now, sadly, and I miss you terribly, and I'd like to import you um, <laughs> every day. Um, Sausage! Uh, question about the... Festival on Rest and Resistance, yep. which um, is something that has Fa become very present for me in my current role. Yep. And I wondered whether it's going to run again. Fa um, yes, I mean, we can do it again if, you in if people invite us and give us space, resources and support. <laughs> Great. We need all of those things, though. You need to be, we need to be given space, money and support. <laughs> and then we can do, make stuff happen. So there could be an Australian version of it would be amazing. Yeah, it would be really Great. amazing. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Was that literally the question? Yeah, absolutely. Biscuit. Biscuit. That's I think there are really different ways of acknowledging rest and resistance, and particularly with the relaxed, relaxed venues are a really early idea, and there's plenty of room for that to grow and evolve. But working and testing that methodology in different, um, across different types of institution and at different levels and in different ways is something that we're really open to doing. Sausage is definitely a work in progress. Fuck it. Have a question there. Hello. Hi, thank you. That was brilliant. Uh, my name's Hayley. Um, Hi. I'm really um, pleased to hear you say uh, it's not just the artists that matter. My particular Fuck. interest is um, uh, sort of hidden disability within uh, neuro neurodiversity in Woo! the cultural workforce, absolutely, <laughs> which Fuck. is often a hidden thing. Um, Hedgehog. And I guess a lot of the conversation is around audiences Fuck. and artists, and I, I, and I think there's a degree to which the sector feels more comfortable talking about Fair. artists and audiences and we don't think enough about about the systems that affect everybody Fair. i just wondered if you've got any anything else to say about that so um it is absolutely essential that the people supporting and programming work that happens in our spaces are representative of our communities um in their broader sense um and it's really important, particularly with thinking about 
hidden impairments. Um, it's really important that people are supported and feel safe talking about those access requirements or the things that um, the, bar the, un the unseen barriers that they might be grappling with so that they can get the right support. I think it's, there is a lot of expectation from very young actually that you, uh, that you mask, that you conceal, that you adjust, that it is your problem and therefore you have to hide it in order to succeed. We need to change those messages. It has to be about openness, understanding, and sort of negotiating how we use resources and space to make sure that we are supporting each other. And I think that there is a, certainly, as my body and mind has changed, and particularly my body in terms of the sort of pain and fatigue that I experience has increased over the last few years, we can't just treat energy as a, like as a resource that everybody has in abundance. We have to build practices that are much more nurturing, and it has to be everybody. It has to be all of our, or all of the people running our sectors, because it's about programming. Biscuit. Festivals that focus particular perspectives are important, but that shouldn't be the only time that people are programmed, or the only time we think about the need for rest um, as, part of our, as part of our working practice. Sausage! Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> Fuck. Fuck. Do we have any more questions? See. Okay, uh, we'll take one more question there, thank you. Here's the bread. I love cats. Pass the mic. Fuck it. Uh, my question was really about when you have an environment that isn't inclusive and you want to make it inclusive, and whether, whether, you, whether you almost have to sort of stop the people coming in, if there's a space limitation. I've got a kind of particular situation that I've inherited that feels Fuck. not inclusive, and I'd like it to be inclusive, and I almost feel there's a culture of it not being inclusive, and I never know whether you need to stop and almost start again, or whether you think it is possible to kind of, kind of create an environment and fe for people to shift with you. I was just interested if you had any thoughts about that. I think it's absolutely possible to make adjustments and shift things as a gradual process. I think definitely the process at Battersea has been, is, is a shift that is continuing to happen. Um, and that sometimes buildings, even buildings that seem very accessible can be quite exhausting to work, to be in. Um, so I think it is, it's a, sometimes you need to stop and start again. There are times where it's like, it's better if we just think this through from the beginning. And sometimes it is better to adjust, make adjustments, try stuff out, learn from it. I think often within our sector, there's, a there's this feeling that we have to get it right first time and uh, like do it perfectly and that if we fail, that somehow we should just pack it in and never try again. <laughs> which is ridiculous because like art and creativity is about testing things out, about learning from it. Um, and so certainly within BAC, we have, we have a number of interventions where we've been scaling up to the Festival of Rest and Resistance. We haven't gone straight in and just done that immediately. It's been a two year process of change, but you have to start somewhere. And I think if there's, you know, in the UK, there's the Equality Act, and we took that talks about reasonable adjustments. Biscuit. And I think when the Disability Discrimination Act first came in, lots of venues sort of panicked and audited their spaces and were like, All right, these are the changes that we make, will make, and these are the ones that are, are too big. These are not reasonable for us to make. And then they've never thought about it again. Biscuit. And so when it comes to what's reasonable or not, or to responses to barriers, yeah, it might not be reasonable to do something when you first identify it. But is it still reasonable that that barrier remains unchanged five, 10, 15 years down the line? Biscuit, I don't think so. So it's important that we don't just, and it's about that idea of adjustment. We can adjust to, uh, to inequality and be like, well, that's just, this is, this is the, how it is in this space. We don't work with disabled people or we don't, you know, we don't work with communities in particular ways. Someone else will be doing that. It's like, we can't have that attitude. We have to start somewhere and we have to be ready to fail and to learn from those failures. Because um, they're never purely failures. There's always, there's always important, important learning shifting that happens as part of that. Um, but reach out for support. There are some amazing organizations championing um, inclusive practice across the country, um, in the UK and internationally. Use those resources. Don't expect disabled people to do the work for you. 
but use their expertise. One of the key ideas with becoming a relaxed venue with how we've worked with BAC is that we have not done the work for them. They have done the work and we have been part of guiding and supporting that process. So right, Sage, thank you. Thank you. So I believe that Jess's keynote this morning has perfectly set the tone for the rest of the day. Uh, so uh, as I say, we're running a little bit behind, but it's absolutely fine. Sessions begin at 11.30, but the um, moderators are aware we might get a little bit late. So please go out, uh, explore the sessions, and explore whole that's, uh, that's across uh, different venues. Could I ask you just one more time to show appreciation for Jess Tom? <laughs>